Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third quarter of 21 Investment Advisory Board for AnchorStar Wealth. Uh, you may, first of all, ask, why are we doing this? And I want to give you a little bit of an insight into why first, and then we'll go through uh, the actual meeting, which my presentation portion of it should be about 12 to 15 minutes. I'll go through that very quickly, and then we'll open up to questions after that. So first of all, why are, why are we, why do we even have an investment advisory board when I haven't had one uh, for the past seven years? Well, AnchorStar Wealth is growing. I have the first full-time hire. I anticipate having the second full-time hire here in January where I hire a junior advisor. I've taken some capital on through some investors and we are in the mode to grow. Uh, for doing that, we need in any growth organization, you need to put processes in place that are going to be there over the long term. So when you think of Anchor Star Wealth, uh, it started as you know Steve retires from the Air Force and starts his own business to now it's growing into a full business, not just a boutique, uh, one person off doing their thing into a full-blown organization. Whereas many of you I've talked to you about how the, the end state for Anchor Star Wealth, you know, 19 people have a full-time lawyer, full-time CPA on staff to be able to deliver in-house servicing versus the uh, continuous conversation I have with folks where I can only take you so far and then I have to recommend you out uh, to somebody else. So that's really the purpose of standing these uh, processes up a little bit early. Uh, right now, so standing the, the investment advisory board, I do have two other individuals. So it's myself and Mr. Donaldson and Mr. Bentley. Uh, I thank them for their interest in becoming uh, joining the investment advisory board. Uh, if you are interested in joining the board, contact me outside of this uh, venue and I will let you know uh, what the process is for that to see if it is uh, right for you. Uh, but we're standing up this process, trying to turn Anchor Star Wealth from a, uh, again, small business to a do all of the same things that the professional fully stood up, you know, enduring organizations do as far as uh, processes. And so that's why we're doing it today. The only thing I can guarantee for sure is that it's not going to be perfect. So uh, lower your expectations just a touch. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, just had his quarterly earnings call. He was uh, entertaining and funny, and he also announced his, they're moving their headquarters to Austin. So that is obviously great news for those of us here. I know some people won't be happy uh, with the traffic, but overall, it's a great, great win for Texas, great win for Austin. As far as my presentation, I have no earth shattering uh, bombs to drop, if you will, as far as, uh, you know, major announcements. But what I do want to do is give uh, either current investors or potential investors, a look under the hood of how we do business here at Anchor Star Wealth. And then uh, you can start to ask questions. So uh, I've introduced the board. I do want to talk to that next point there. The Q&A window is for questions. Uh, I'm going to give my presentation, then I will go to the questions. I will answer the questions. When we're done with questions, we will be done. I do have the room scheduled for an hour and a half. If it takes that long, I will answer questions that long. If not, that's okay too. Uh, if anything, it's just a warm up run for everybody to kind of see what this is like, and we will go from there. So thank you all for attending. The chat window, I am not monitoring the chat window. I have our other board member, uh, Mr. Bentley couldn't be here. Mr. Donaldson is online. Um, the uh, he's a panelist. So Mr. Donaldson, if you have anything you want to communicate directly with me, uh, send that through the chat window. And after I present, I'll give you the opportunity, uh, you know, just go through the chat if you don't want to come on camera, uh, because this again, only a 48 hours announcement on this. So uh, again, crawl, walk, run philosophy, but I'll give you first shot at questions or things you think that I should bring up. Again, do that through the private chat. Everybody else uh, for the pub, for the chat room, I'm not even looking at it. I'm not going to look at it. That's for you to converse with each other or throw BS flags or whatever you want to do uh, uh, in there. With that, let's go ahead and get started. You always start with the standard disclosure. Uh, so normally I sit through these all the time. So it's, it's more of a blah, 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 because I've always heard it. But as far as this presentation, it is being recorded. Uh, so therefore, uh, it is available afterwards and you can uh, review it till your heart's content. I will send out the presentation, the link to it through the Anchor Star Wealth Facebook page. Uh, it will also, uh, it'll be hanging on YouTube. So if you want to refer somebody and you want to give them an insight as to how I invest to hear me talk, learn a little bit more about the organization, uh, then please invite them to uh, listen in and view the presentation. Uh, it is solely for current and potential clients of Anchor Star Wealth. So it's really not for uh, in any other use other than if you really think somebody's interested, 
go ahead and show it to them. And other than that, uh, that's really about the extent of it. Uh, obviously, I'll be talking about individual securities during this um, the presentation, I will also be talking about index funds, mutual funds, and private equity investments. None of that is a particular, you know, the full disclosure there. I'm not saying uh, go out and buy it. You have to do your own due diligence. You know, this is a financial education presentation. Um, so do your own due diligence for acting upon anything you hear in this presentation. However, I'm giving you the full open kimono look at what I'm invested in in the book. Uh, I sometimes talk about whether or not I'm personally invested in it, and then we can go from there. Uh, let's see, it will not be a complete overview of any security. So again, you have to do your own due diligence. And just because something performed in the past, obviously, it will, doesn't necessarily perform that way in the future. Any investments can and do lose money. Yes, the entire stock market could crash and go to zero. Could happen. Uh, certain statements, these are forward-looking statements on my behalf. This is what I think. I'm going to use the term we a lot. I've discussed many of these with the, uh, the board members as well as other clients. So I'm going to use the we uh, and from here on out. So uh, the last, if you want more information down here at the bottom right is Anchor Star Wealth has the full disclosure that's required by SEC, which has a full information on my firm. Uh, Anchor Star Wealth has full information on me in the uh, ADV Part 2A and TARP part to be disclosures, as well as Fender's broker check site there if you want to do your own due diligence on me. All right, here's our organization. I'm just going to cover this briefly, uh, but basically wealth management firm looking for that concierge level of service. I do charge less than the industry standard and because I can keep my overhead costs down. I fully intend to, as we grow, continue to do that. We're not about fancy offices. We're about delivering quality service and we can do, th do that through distributed operations. At least that's my intent. We shall see once you get to a certain size, then I think we will have to have a brick and mortar headquarters uh, that will be down the road. But what do I pride myself on, which this is permeated throughout the culture of this organization, is rapid response to client concerns. So right now there's two of us soon to grow, had interns this summer. Basically, if anything lands on our plate that comes from a client, we deal with it as quickly as we can to reassure the client and let them you know, meet their needs and have them move on. Uh, the rest of this information uh, you can look at in a replay if you want. Uh, 45 million assets under management, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. So here's what the each month we were going to look at the book and what is in the book. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything that's in the book, the book being the entirety of the investments, but I will tell you what the top 10 holdings and I will tell you percentages because that gives you insight into what you should think about the uh, the future of the market and potential returns. Uh, so we'll go left to right here. We'll start with the combined AUM, AUA, that stands for assets under management slash assets under advisements. The difference is uh, if I'm managing an account for a client, that means we can log in through a separate login, not theirs, but through a in, uh, institutional login, see into their account, make changes on their behalf and you know directly. Uh, assets under advisement are things like 401k slash thrift savings plan where folks uh, have to send me a statement and then I have to give provide them the uh, adjustments, if you will, and recommendations, and then they have to go in and make their own um, adjustments at that point. Uh, total assets under management, that's as of today, uh, September. We just got out of September. That was the worst month. Uh, since March of 2020. Uh, you might have noticed that as a firm we're growing, obviously individual accounts were challenged uh, due, to spend, due to the sell-off in September, as well as the increased sell-off in some of the technological and the tech holdings that we have out there. But overall, 82% of the stuff uh, we manage here is assets under management. That's physically able to log in uh, through the two custodians that, that we use, Schwab and TD Ameritrade. Again, they're combining, that's a long process. Um, but that's hands-on management that we're able to do. Uh, assets under advisement, a little over 10% there. Again, that's 401k sort of saving plans. And then alternatives, which I'll talk about in the right-hand column once I go back to the right, correct slide, is things that are not really available to traditional investors. Uh, I want to pride myself on us being able to offer the full suite of investments, including private equity, venture capital, private placements, uh, opportunity zones, other things that, that come out there. And largely these are relationships I've built here in the Austin area. There's a lot of money here, a lot of major players, and I've been able to foster these relationships over the past seven years. So I, I know these people personally. So when we go to now allocate our, our capital towards them, uh, there's a personal relationship behind it. Like most of you and I have this personal relationship that sets the backs 
backstone, uh, back background, you know, cornerstone of trust and confidence uh, there. Also, uh, let's see, as far as standard investments, that's Schwab and TD Ameritrade. I have 237 positions. Those are individual stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, options, those sorts of things. Folks ask, is that common? If you get into, if, if I was running a hedge fund, no, we'd probably neck that down to you know 30 to 50 positions that we'd move in and out of uh, fairly tactically. Uh, in the separately managed account space, uh, I have about 50 positions that I personally recommend to clients. And that's what most of the portfolios are built around those 50 positions. Those are the ones I own myself and obviously have the highest level of confidence in those positions. The rest are either inherited, meaning folks turn, bring in a taxable account. Possibly they have a huge taxable gain in a position. Uh, just pick like AT&T that they've held for 50 years. Well, they can't sell it because of the tax consequences. So there are some positions that I inherit or some people say, hey, what do you think of this company? And I say, well, I wouldn't invest in it, but uh, certainly we can put that in, in your account if you'd like, those sorts of things. So circle of expertise is about 50 stocks. Circle of competence is about 250 stocks. And then I have an opinion on about another thousand. Uh, so when we get to the question and answer, if you wanna ask individual stock questions, I highly encourage that. Uh, however, if you get too far out of my mainstream or away from my, the main themes that I talk about, I may not be able to answer off the cuff, right? I may have to get back to you. As far as overall allocation, this, this does come as a surprise to some folks, is we have uh, less than half of the book is in straight equities, which is the individual stock positions. I do pride myself on investing you know, in that low drag, highly focused Let's go into the individual stock environment. However, not everybody's up for that, i.e. their risk tolerance doesn't want, they don't want to do individual stocks. That's fine. Um, and a lot of folks are in retirement where individual stocks may or may not be the answer depending on your situation. Um, however, but less than half in equities and then there's index funds that I use, which are the ETFs, almost 30% there. Mutual funds, I generally do not use uh, here just because you can generally find an index fund with a cheaper uh, cheaper expense ratio than an actively managed mutual fund. Uh, so we go for the cheaper option, again, lower drag out there if we can find it. Do have several bonds, both individual funds, bonds and bond funds that we've built out into ladders for retirees, ranging anywhere from super safe municipal bonds, which are tax-free, all the way into investment grade, high yield, and then private credit. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second. And then, of course, you always keep cash on hand. Some people keep cash on hand uh, because they, they live out of their accounts, meaning they have a full checkbook, uh, debit card, and house payments coming out of their account. It's very, once you hit what I would say the higher level, uh, seven digits into your taxable brokerage account, you can basically live out of it. It becomes your bank. You can get your mortgage from Schwab. It's very it's very cool at the higher ends. Uh, below that, probably need to keep a traditional bank, if you will. And the last one there under options, I do have some options in there, not really for trading, but more for investing. If you're familiar with the covered call strategy, again, risk management, basics of hedging, that's what I use options for. Uh, I have um, all of those, again, are negative. It shows a negative here because, again, they work opposite the market because they are a hedge. Over in the right-hand column, let's talk about alternative investments. If you're not familiar with these, uh, you do have to qualify for many of them, meaning you have to be an accredited investor, which means you either have to make 200 or 200,000 a year or 300,000 if you are married, uh, you, or you have a million in investable assets to be able to even touch this stuff. It is considered high risk. It is considered illiquid mostly, meaning you can't buy it and sell it on a daily basis. However, you get a premium for the offerings that they have because you're able to get in early. So when you think of pre-IPO, private equity, distressed real estate, some of those places that you just probably don't want to venture in on your own. I've vetted all of these organizations. We and, and I have the you know built relationships so, and I have my own private money in all of the Blackstone stuff uh, and then some of the other stuff down below that you see. Uh, Blackstone is the best out there private they're the biggest private equity firm. That's a fact. Best is my opinion. Uh, obviously, I only deal in best of breed, whether it's stocks or private equity. Um, so there's different offerings that they have. If you're interested in those, again, those are mostly accredited investor stuff. Um, so depending on your net worth, income, et cetera, reach out if you're interested in learning more. Uh, Self-directed IRAs. I do have a client that just bought a house inside of his IRA. 
you can do that. Uh, there are many rules that apply. I am now a new expert on that since I had a client that I just walked through it. Uh, it's easy to do. It cannot be a second home or a vacation property. It has to be a true business asset. But there are several things you can put in a self-directed IRA. I have a self-directed IRA now uh, for one of my investments in venture capital. Um, so I am familiar with the process, can walk you through it. And, and if you're interested in those sorts of things. Um, Cantor Fitzgerald and Opportunity Zone, if you're familiar with the tax uh, you know, to avoid um, paying taxes or minimizing the amount of taxes that you pay. You can uh, get rid of capital gains if you go through an opportunity zone. Pretty cool. And then Outlayer and Farm Invest is a uh, technology VC uh, offering that I had that is still looking for money if you're interested. And then Farm Invest is a nationwide uh, program where you can invest in specific plots of farmland. Just kind of interesting. It's not my uh, I don't have money there, but it is interesting for those that might be interested in something that gets you. Why would you be in an alternative investment? The returns are higher on average. Uh, it's riskier. So, I mean, the downside can be, can you know, it can go to zero of some of these things, but the returns are higher. That's in capable hands. I've vetted them. So if you go through me, I'm telling you that, yes, I either have money there myself. So I believe, or I've vetted them to where I think it's safe as in the farm invest option. Okay, let's talk specifically to the Anchor Star Wealth Investment book. This is no kidding, a straight merge of TD Ameritrade and Schwab, the accounts that I manage for folks, uh, hands on every day. Uh, some folks ask how I manage the accounts. Well, if I want to increase my position in Apple, much like a hedge fund goes out and buys a thousand shares or 5,000, same thing, Anchor Star Wealth. I'm like, okay, we're adding Apple here on this dip go out and buy the shares, those come into the house account. And then I have until the end of the day, 5 p.m. Eastern, so I even have an extra hour after the market closes to now turn around and allocate that to different accounts. That's why having you know a couple million in cash in the book on hand every day allows me to make tactical moves like that um, and in and out of account. Same thing if I want to, uh, when the Chinese uh, Ever Evergrande, fiasco uh, that, that took place a couple of weeks ago, and you had to make a quick exit out of several of the Chinese names, I can also log in, right click, sell all, and boom, we're done. We're out of Alibaba, out of Didi, um, out of KWeb, some of the other names that you've heard me talk about for years. Sometimes, you know, you can just right click and you're done. That's how fast it can happen uh, out, of, out of these accounts. So, Back to the top 10 holdings, you know, mutual funds and index funds have to publish a top 10 holding. Um, Kathy Wood, ARK Invest, she publishes every day. Good for her. She has a staff. I don't uh, yet. I have a small staff, but she's got a huge staff that's able to do that on a daily basis. I will do this quarterly. This is the look look under the hood as, to far, as, as far as what I believe uh, more than anything right? Uh, top holding in the book, it has been for several years and continues to be is Apple. That's the individual stock. Again, the uh, must-have uh, products luxury as well as their functionality is probably what I consider the most amazing thing is you put you in your Apple ID and it just works, right? The Also, what's really the why I'm not leaving this name over, you know, there's ups and downs. Sometimes you trim some, sometimes you add some, sometimes you sell a whole bunch and buy a house out of your IRA because it was courtesy of the gains you've made in Apple over the past decade. Uh, you know, the, but really the iCar, which is the Apple car, which is still rumored, but you know that they hired over a hundred car engineers uh, over a year ago to be able to start working on this thing. So much like Apple has in other forms of its business kept things a secret until it announces it. I do expect around 23, 24 uh, for the iCar to be announced. I do think it will largely be autonomously driven first and you know self-driven second. And I do think it will be more of a public transportation type of uh, network. Thinking uh, the city of Austin buys 5,000, well, I'll probably have to buy Teslas now. So then maybe that's a bad example so after uh, uh, Elon's an announcement today. But say uh, Seattle buys 1,000 Apple cars and they're all over the place, much like the little scooters are now, right? And in the major cities. Um, whether or not you believe that theory, uh, I do think that the younger generations do believe in that. Uh, car, no, car ownership is expensive. You can make a case all day long uh, that it's cheaper to just use transportation, distributed transportation, and I agree. 
I agree with them. I still love my car, so nobody's going to take those from me. But I do think the future is more of a distributed operations. And I think Tesla and Apple are the one and two players uh, there. And I think Apple will win out. Otherwise, we'd be heavier into Tesla. Okay, the next one is manage municipal bonds. Uh, municipal bonds are tax free. They generate around this fund generates around 2%. So this is for folks that are looking for a super safe uh, environment that are to, to make a little bit of money that they don't like it sitting in the bank. Uh, I tell folks, if you have over 50K sitting in the bank, you're doing the bank a great favor and they can put on parties and build nice buildings and sponsor football teams because of your cash sitting there. But if you would like to actually do that for yourself, uh, you can go into uh, municipal bonds, again, fully distributed across the country, uh, generating this 2%. Do, do municipalities fail? Yes, but not very often. Um, and that's absorbed into the fund. So, and it's tax free. So, if you're mad or if you're making over 400K in income and you just don't want to pay anymore, uh, consider. That's why I have folks in there. And that's largely how I hold cash too. I either hold complete cash or I hold it in FMB uh, for folks that make 2%. So it becomes their bank account. That's what I do with my money that's just sitting around that I'm waiting for the next best idea to move into. It's sitting in FMB. Uh, FIXD is one step higher on the risk ladder. That is investment grade bonds. Uh, they're opportunity uh, bonds. So they have to have a certain portfolio portion of their portfolio in investment grade and the rest of that portfolio, they can get a little higher risk uh, for return uh, out there. So, you know, you think this kicks off about 4% in perpetuity. So it just sits there and, you know, the stock, the price stays about the same and it kicks off a monthly dividend, just like FMB uh, around that 4% level. So very attractive uh, when, again, you're making nothing in the bank or you want to reduce your overall exposure uh, to the market. Uh, next up, number four holding is Amazon. Uh, if you remember back to March 2020, and I will tell you, I'm sitting here today in the position that we're at today, not only personally, but professionally, uh, but because uh, we stuck to our guns in March 2020. And when Amazon, you know, it's like we're in a pandemic and people are fire selling their stocks. And again, largely people aren't in individual stocks. So they're just selling stuff, right? Sell, selling funds, dumping TSP, all of that. Well, what you're doing, there's some babies with the bathwater there is, I don't know, think about the number one company that is best positioned to benefit from a pandemic would be the company that can deliver to your door when nobody can leave the house. That's Amazon. It was a no brainer at 1500. I still think it's attractive here and it's more than doubled uh, since the bottom there, what a year and year, a year and a half ago, basically. So <clears throat> again, when people sell things, they don't really, in your, when you're in funds, you don't have that same focus because you're just like, ah, tech fund have to sell it, right? Because it's losing money. It's like, well, you would never sell your Amazon stock, but you just did because it's in a fund. Okay, next up, cybersecurity. My honestly, my number one theme going forward here. Uh, if you remember, we had the pipeline attack. Uh, not too long ago, the folks that did it uh, just lost something here. Stand by, share this back out. And here we go. <clears throat> there we go. Back to the uh, screen. Cybersecurity, you know, they demanded crypto. There's going to be cybersecurity attacks until the end of time, is my thesis. And there's going to be a lot of money out there. I have to spend almost $1,000 a year to protect my systems. Uh, and that's only going up as we grow up. So th fantastic theme going forward. Uh, KDUX is a diversified credit fund. So when you, if you're not familiar with credit, this is when you take a step up higher on the risk level, it's fixed income. Uh, so where FMB paid out 2%, FIXD pays out 4%, uh, KDUX pays out 6%. So even higher there, they pay out monthly. So you can live off this. It's a good place to have a lot of money. And again, the credit space, which was what almost brought down the house 2007 and 2009 is really pretty, I call it safe, <clears throat> okay? So when you think of the analogy I use for folks that say, I don't wanna be in private credit, I'm like, okay, well, don't be in private credit. But <clears throat> if you will, think of 9-11. We still, when you go to the airport almost 20 years later, have to pay for the security that's in place. You don't have to pay for it but in your time, with time you do. Um, Basically, we still have those procedures in place to stop the next 9-11. Well, that's not what's going to get us, right? But we still have those procedures in place. So a lot of the procedures that came out of the global financial crisis are still in place, which means these areas are now much safer, uh, you know, almost too safe, if you will. The regulation is crazy. Uh, so a lot of these funds, Aries Capital, Blackstone, have gone into the private space so they can make you that 6% with Aries, 8% with Blackstone. Um, 
you know, month pays monthly, just like a paycheck. I mean, it is just income coming in. All right, next up, diversified U.S. real estate. Again, this is really the inflation hedge. Uh, most of many of us own our own homes. If you don't, uh, this is one good way to get exposure to real estate. When I talk to younger investors, they don't want to buy a house, but they do want exposure to real estate because they've, they're worried either about inflation or they've seen how real estate is one of the uh, legs of wealth building, which it is. Uh, so that's a way to go into it without actually owning the property. Uh, Alphabet is Google. Uh, the, you know, you're on Google every day. That's the number one advertiser in the, in the nation. Uh, if you want to get your company in front of people, you need to pay Google to do it because the average search just won't cut it anymore. Uh, so amazing advertising dollars coming in and I do not see anybody coming up and unseating Google anytime soon. <clears throat> the next one is artificial intelligence slash robotics. Uh, this is the pure tech play, if you will, for all the advances that are going on. Uh, again, this has been going on for over 100 years, right? Trying to have technology come in and replace people and make uh, businesses more efficient and cheaper. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's amazing the advances are being made, and that's only going to continue. Uh, the last one there is a global asset allocation. I have, when I first started this business, I was almost entirely US based with some in China. I stayed that way basically for six to seven years. This fund, I've now started increasing, I own some personally, is a global asset allocation, but it's still only in the major, major um, countries of the world. You're not generally in Africa or South America, you're mostly in Europe, uh, with some India and China thrown in. So it's a way to diversify away from the United States, if you're especially if you're worried about the future of the United States, which I know many are, we're not going to go political here, but <clears throat> I know some people have concerns there. All right, investment themes going forward. Touch upon these quickly. The shift towards fixed income. Um, back in the 80s, we could get, you know, five, six, seven, eight percent in a CD uh, certificate of deposit. You can't get that anymore. That hadn't been around for years. If you try to buy an annuity, you can pay a bunch of money to a company who's going to give you about half of what that actual return is worth, and they're going to keep the money. So that's a non-starter for most people. Um, <clears throat> so really, how do you do it yourself? How do you create your own fixed income? That's what I do for folks. And I ladder this stuff out. Uh, so you have different exposures at different yield levels, as well as all the way up into dividend aristocrats. There is absolutely no reason to buy at and because, you know, the stock's just, you know, opinion not going up, but it hasn't for years. It's been a black hole of money, but it does pay out a nice dividend. So if you're structuring your capital uh, to pay out a dividend, that is a good place to have it. If you want to make any money, I would say that would be a terrible place uh, to have it. So something to consider. Uh, cybersecurity, I already talked about national defense. I think the uh, departure from Afghanistan casts some significant doubt on the United States as far as their ability to implement and execute their national security policy. So I do think that we will start to see things pop up worldwide, including you know China flying over Taiwan right now and increasing the numbers of those flights. Uh, I think national defense stocks are gonna be a place to be for at least three years. That's not a necessary political commentary, but maybe even more, because I think we've damaged our credibility uh, to a significant extent. Uh, real estate, we already talked about inflation protection. Mostly, if you're worried about things inflating, you want real property. You want either real estate. Uh, cryptos are a place that is a hedge against inflation. Um, also, the stock market, individual stocks or equities, especially, are places you don't you want money. Uh, where you don't want money is either in bond funds that are funds, individual bonds or municipals are fine, um, <clears throat> or cash. Cash in the bank is obviously in an inflationary environment, that's the worst place to have it. But um, after you have your operating cash, right? Keep enough on hand, then invest the rest. Artificial intelligence and robotics, we already talked about online retail. Again, the uh, people that are now working more from their homes, they don't have to live in big cities. And if anything, if they're worried about COVID or COVID, you know, next generation, whatever that turns out to be, moving out away from the big cities, that means online retail is only going to increase. I think that is a no-brainer. Uh, clean energy, of course, it's been a theme for years. That's only going to continue. Healthcare is you know, the aging demographic. Of course, that's one. COVID is another uh, for the vaccines and such, but also distributed healthcare. Um, thinking of medical technology, a lot of you know delivery to your door sort of things. So there's a lot in the healthcare space that's attractive that isn't an actual drug. Um, technology, we talked about data management is a huge one. If you've followed me for very long, you'll hear me say data is the new oil. So when you think oil from the 80s, 90s, 
um, even into the 2000s. Now it's going to be about data going forward. Um, data analysis software. So when you think of companies that help you sort through the data and make decisions based off of it, data centers, the sheer storage for a company, think of a company like Facebook and all the data centers that they have because, or cloud services providers like Amazon cloud, they need to have oceans of these data centers to be able to keep your data safe and back it up and everything that goes with it. Uh, cloud computing operating from the cloud. Uh, is important for anybody that's out there who has a distributed operation who needs to have joint access to different files and things. Uh, anything with a subscription service out there is obviously a, an attractive investment to us uh, because we want to capitalize on that. They sign on once and then they just pay over time uh, for a good service. And then data collection, I put collection in quotes, uh, that's Facebook, right? So, you know, any of the social medias are actually collecting data and then turning around and using that um, to make money. Um, you know, that good, that debate's going on with the whistleblower and Zuck's testimony and all that. I uh, won't cover it here, but it's a moneymaker. It really is. <clears throat> the stock may get hit in the short term. I've left it uh, some. Uh, it hadn't, didn't get everybody out of Facebook, but we'll be back, right? Facebook needs to reinvent a little bit and we'll be back. Uh, luxury products, people are richer than ever. And I know when I say that, people laugh. I do agree that it is a rich get richer environment. I mean, we're or bifurcated, if you will, right? There's the <clears throat> folks that have money, make more money, and the folks that don't have money, it seems like they can't get out of the hole. I do agree that it's more of a challenge for sure, but for those that are making money, especially when you have a stimulus package out there, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of money in people's hands and they like nice stuff. So therefore it's very attractive. Uh, infrastructure bill, obviously that's kind of a political football right now, but obviously we need to upgrade our infrastructure around the US. So a lot of money flowing behind that. Uh, 5G, 6, 6G, that's all your uh, telephones and uh, <clears throat> networks you have for your MacBooks and things. Uh, 6G again being the next generation that's coming. Augmented and virtual reality. <clears throat> again, uh, many, uh, lots of opportunities there uh, for the future. The one I like to use is in virtual reality. Uh, there's going to be a time, uh, and you've seen, you see some spots of this. One of the football teams had an actual bird fly through the stadium that wasn't there, right? It was a you know, virtual reality thing, uh, but it looked real. Uh, you're going to see more and more of that. One of the things I'd like to say is somebody pick somebody that's passed away, uh, say Muhammad Ali. And if you want to, if you're a boxing fanatic, uh, either there's going to be a way in virtual reality for the entirety of everything Muhammad Ali said during his lifetime to go into his character. And it will be able to, you'll basically be able to sit across the table from him, ask him questions and have it, have this piece of technology, virtual reality, answer those questions in his voice with the stuff that he would actually say. So unbelievable opportunities here. Uh, sports gambling, whether you believe it or not, people love to gamble and they can do it right there from their handheld devices. So you wanna, <clears throat> you wanna have some money behind that. Uh, payment processors have always made money. Uh, again, everything, you know, the, the cashless society that's going on out there, there's a couple of new names in the space. One was big up uh, big uh, two days ago. Um, from a new opportunity with Target, um, but good place to have uh, names. Digital advertising, again, Facebook and Google are your real two places for that. If you want to advertise, you have to go there, basically. And the cryptocurrencies, I won't talk about those too much, but I do think it's one of the major themes uh, going forward. And I stay pretty close to the mainstream, meaning I, you know, Bitcoin, I don't own any of it outright. I own proxies. So we can talk about that in Q&A if you want to know how I own it. Uh, but I think if you're, you know, if you don't like it, you don't believe in it, don't participate. But if you do, you definitely want to grab some because I think the particular circumstance of especially Bitcoin and they can't make any more and people aren't selling just means it's a good investment. What did not work in 2021? Where did we lose the most money? Chinese technology, hands down. Uh, I love that stuff. We've made a lot of money over time and then we turn around and lost it. Uh, not all of it. I mean, some of this we've held for years like Alibaba, Neo, <clears throat> those, those names, but significant hit up to the tune of 50% uh, in some of these names. So depending on your risk tolerance, some of it, some of you will ride through it. Uh, some will not. Some I sold along the way, and but almost across the board is for loss. Uh, Chinese retail. Now you think moving into more of the Alibaba um, or consumer base like Didi is more, it's not technically a retail, uh, but Didi is the Uber of China. Um, you know, the Chinese Netflix, Iqui, uh, there's many names out there that lost a lot of money. <clears throat> Again, must sells. You had to kind of get rid of them with the Chinese government cracking down on monopolies over there. 
Uh, the legalization of marijuana theme, I thought that was a no brainer going into the blue wave election uh, last November. It is it has hardly gotten any press. Right. And uh, certainly very little movement. Uh, so, again, no money being made there. Uh, if anything, money's being lost there. So uh, taking a pause out of that for most people. And the last one is kind of an offshoot of that, but medical psychedelic use for some of the major problems we have in society. Um, we have, you know, bipolar or ADD, ADHD, um, PTSD, some, you know, al alphabet soup there. But uh, there's significant, I do believe the thesis that you can use some of the um, psychedelic drugs are out there. They're all illegal, right? They're type class one or type one drugs. Um, but in micro doses, there's, you're able to go in and kind of unlock the brain and kind of heal the brain from some of these things. So, so we were like, well, why would we even bother? Well, what we're doing now is like with children, as soon as they're diagnosed as ADHD, they get put on Ritalin or, you know, Prozac or whatever the drug is, and then they're on it for the rest of their life. So they basically have a chemical dependency that we bake in to the individual. Uh, it's not just children, but you know, if there's other opportunities here and if it works, and I'm not saying it does, but I'm saying if it works, there is going to be a ton of money made in the space. All right, forecast, <clears throat> and then we'll wrap up and get to your questions. The, uh, you know, 2021 was basically a boilerplate that I put out uh, on the 1st of January, and really it's, it's held true, is we needed to pass the stimulus. We did check done. Market went higher. We needed to defeat COVID. We did. Check. Market went higher. I know some of you are going, but did we? And that's when the market came in is now you get into the third quarter and it's just like Delta variant. Uh, you know, maybe we didn't beat it as much as we thought. Uh, things are opening up all through the summer. And then, of course, the cases started to rise again. Um, Pass the infrastructure bill. Well, July 4th is when uh, we, we were going to do that you know, still being argued about, but it will pass. I mean, it's all done, but the details or the pork, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but the money is going to flow out into society once it passes. So the market goes higher. And then the headwind was initiate the uh, tax reform. Uh, the initial ideas actually proposed weren't as bad as I thought they would be, uh, but it did certainly put a headwind in the market. And then of course the unforeseen things like uh, the Afghanistan departure, you know, not necessarily one for one with the market, but it did affect the confidence in the government and then the debt ceiling. A lot of things are being hashed out right now that are the market selling off until basically it's a wait and see sort of thing of, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's take a look at how all this plays out before we allocate our uh, capital uh, back in. All right. So what's coming up in Q4? I think it's these are my opinions. I think we'll have a sideways slash volatile equity market. People every day when we have one of the big sell offs, are you ready to buy the dip? Nope. Uh, sitting in cash, largely moving into fixed income instruments, really going into capital preservation mode. The market may go higher. Sure, of course. You know, every day the you know the market recovers two days in a row after the big sell-off on you know Monday or Tuesday, whenever it was. Yeah, so what? No, we didn't miss it. We're going to have an opportunity to put capital back to work later. So conservative for now, not looking to make any killings, staying in smart names uh, while we wait for the market to come in. I think there are significant inflation concerns. We're we're gonna we're about to get the cost of living adjust, adjustment announced. I think it will be north of five percent. Again, that adjusts Social Security as well as military retirement for the military retired listeners out there. Um, <clears throat> but I think that will confirm the inflation concerns that are out there. I don't think that inflation is as bad as everyone thinks, but the print in that number is not going to help, and it's certainly going to be an issue in fourth quarter. Um, potential taper, you've heard the Fed talk about, are they going to taper their bond buying or not? Uh, I think that they're going to continue to talk about it, which means the market's going to be hesitant until they actually pull the trigger and do it. And political environment is not good, but I do think on the unfortunate side of that is it kicks the uh, tax reform into 2022, which means the market's not positioned to get that footing to where it now goes higher until we get tax reform passed. And you know, segueing into 2022, you know, this may take, this may be January, this may be July, but it, we need that tax reform to pass. And it's less about what it says, the specifics of it, it's just the fact that it passes. So do what you want with the corporate tax rate, the capital gains rates, the, you know, higher tax brackets. Once it's known, everybody in the money business is able to reprice everything, recalculate the risk and reallocate capital based off of knowns versus the unknowns. In an unknown environment, you wait and see if you're an adult. And that means people are selling off and going to more conservative stuff, waiting for that kind of snapping out of it sort of 
uh, relationship you'll get once the once you have knowns out there. Uh, where what do I think as far as 23 through 25? I do think after the tax reform goes through, I used to think earlier this year it was going to be a series of tax reforms. Uh, I think it'll be a one and done. I really do. I've changed my mind on that. Um, I think they're, you know, the government will go for whatever it's going to do. We'll hash it out literally forever. It'll seem like forever. And then probably by summer of next year, we will actually get the tax reform. It may or may not take place, you know, be retroactive to current year being 2022 now, probably into 2023. But once we have tax reform behind us, I do. I am optimistic about the uh, market returning its move back higher. I do think it's somewhere along the, along the lines the next three years, we will raise rates. Uh, I think we will raise them before it should probably have been done. We did this in 2018, we being the Federal Reserve. Uh, and if you look at the chart of 2018, uh, through the several rate hikes that they had, the market stopped going higher and then sold off. December 2018 was 19.8% in a month. Um, and then basically they went, okay, we give up. We can't really raise rates. And they took them back to zero. Uh, I think we go through that process again because somebody's going to think that's a good idea. Um, I think it's like arguing about the debt ceiling. Uh, it's, it's just not a good, it's just a gargantuan waste of time, uh, right? Because there's really not another option right now. So uh, that's my prediction. I think we'll do fine until we start raising rates and then some tactical maneuvering there to go into cap, capital preservation phase for a while will be smart. All right, lastly, for the decade, I think the, you know, we those have been investing really since 2000, so the past 20 years, if you will, we've been kind of getting used to this 15, 20%, sometimes 30% year over year returns, and that's been doable. And many of us have obviously benefited from that, changed our lives. However, I don't think that's the, you know, I don't think that's likely going forward. I think things have gotten uh, very expensive, you know, the very expensive market, uh, certainly as the, you know, traditional market returns are more likely than the outsized gains. When you look at, <clears throat> You know, if you look at history and study history, you have the revolutionary age and industrial age. I think we were in a technological age there for 2020, 2000 to 2020, uh, where basically we screamed higher because of all the technological advances. I think that continues, but I think all of that money has been made, not all of it. The big chunk of the money, the big move has been made. So if you were invested, you benefited from that. Uh, obviously, I just don't think it's the same way going forward. I can't look people in the eye and say, yeah, I think if we focus in on just a few tech firms, we can get that 20, 30%. Individual names, sure, individual names can double, triple in a year, no doubt about it. But um, the, you know, as far as the uh, year over year, I wouldn't anticipate that. Uh, I do think it'll be a focused, it'll be a kind of winner take all sort of market. Uh, thinking of names like Facebook and Google and Amazon. And I do think eventually sometime in this decade, they get broken up. So, um, and the, that will be a benefit to those who hold, that's not a reason to sell, that's a reason to buy. <clears throat> think of uh, Ma Bell when it broke up, think of other companies. You know, if Amazon broke up and they sold off Amazon Web Services, that would be a money winner, right? If Disney gets too big and finally gets rid of ESPN, sells that off, will you sell ESPN, keep mother Disney? Um, you know, there's going to be some tactical moves that need to be made, but I do think it happens. I think these companies are getting way too big. Um, <clears throat> that's a financial opinion, not a political opinion. Um, but I do think they get broken up eventually. So uh, we shall see. China's kind of talking about that now uh, with Alibaba. So, all right, moving on. I see the chat starting to blow up again. I'm not looking at the chat. So if you have a question, it needs to go in the Q&A. Otherwise, you guys are just conversing with each other uh, in there. All right. <clears throat> Uh, last, next to last slide, the, uh, you can see uh, eight of nine there. There we go. Um, good question. I'll get to that in a second. High risk opportunities, cryptos. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're up for it, if you're up for the risk, could they go to zero? Yes. Could they get banned? If they get banned by the United States, the, they scream higher, right? Uh, that's an opinion. I can't prove that till it happens, but yeah, try They tried banning alcohol one time, right? It didn't really work out. Um, Cryptocurrencies are a little bit of a make believe, make believe land married with the uh, uh, you don't believe in our government anymore, right? So there's all kinds of different angles, but uh, I stay mainstream. I'm not going to put you in the far off stuff. You can have fun with your coin wallets doing that on your own, uh, but there are certainly ways to play it, and I can get into that in the Q and A if you want. Uh, Chinese retail and consumer. I think China comes screaming back. The question is when. Uh, I've done nothing but lose people's money by investing in it recently, but I think we make all that back and more. Uh, we just have to time it right. 
and I don't have the crystal ball. It could be, it's probably not next week. Uh, it may be before next year though. And hopefully it's before next decade because that's going to be a long time. Um, nationwide U.S. legalization of marijuana. I do think it happens. I don't know when. Same sort. It's kind of off the political agenda. But what are we going to talk about once we have tax reform uh, in place? I think we go back to some some of those themes. Uh, psychedelics I've already talked about. And then uh, the man machine technology brain interaction. I do think that the biggest advances we will see in the next 10 years are uh, tying, our, tying the human being to the machine. And I'll, I'll use a flying analogy and then we'll get to questions. Um, yeah, I 100%. So back when I was a kid, so back when I was in my 20s, I played this game and I can't remember what it was called, uh, but they had what's called riggers is what they were called. And you were rigged up to your machine, whether it was an airplane, a helicopter, a tank, um, a car, uh, you basically hopped into it and it was make believe game, right? Um, but you, the, the theory is there's an outlet, you know, or a, a cable and you get into your machine and you plug it in. And then you're able to instantly by thinking something, be able to make it move. Um, if you have followed Neuralink at all uh, with Elon Musk, that is, as far as I know, the, it's a private company. So you can't invest in it. Otherwise, I'd have a lot of money there. Um, <clears throat> but the, the advances, you know, he already has, I believe, is a chimpanzee um, that was able to play a video game or do something with its mind. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. And the money behind that is going to be phenomenal. It's how to get in on it and, uh, you know, and make money off. But I do think that's the most amazing thing that's going to happen. You know, why, why have a steering wheel and a stick and all this other control stuff if you could just use your mind? It's coming. So with that, that is what I have. We're going to go to questions. I do see one question, no whopping one question uh, in there. So I appreciate Mark, you offering that. I haven't read it yet. But for, for the others that are online, uh, again, the chat blowing up. I'm not uh, not watching that, but I am watching the Q&A. So that's where I will answer questions. All right. <clears throat> Before I answer that, uh, Mr. Donaldson, if you have anything, uh, just go ahead and send that to me directly. Let me check that real quick. Okay. Uh, nothing there for uh, me. All right. As far as... Uh, reference back to Muhammad Ali. Let me read this use of his likeness. Yeah. NFTs. Okay. And who gets paid or commodity and also a crypto convertible product. You're getting some of the, you're getting a budget investment bingo here. Where do you see this tokenization process of assets in a decentralized market? A lot of room for potential investment. Is it on each product or something to keep a bead on which companies are looking to promote conversion directly? Yeah. Fantastic question. Uh, there's actually several parts to that. Are, are NFTs real? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, the, the Muhammad Ali was one reference, but take it to the, you know, the uh, Bryce, like blanking on his last name, the Alabama quarterback, you know, before he started the game, he had a million dollars in, you know, endorsements and, you know, all these uh, NFTs, these tokens, the ownership society of a piece of art or work or likeness or uh, intellectual property, however you want to, um, d describe it, whatever the particular NFT is. Right now, you're sure it's decentralized. It's an open market. It's whatever people are willing to pay. Um, how do you capture that? Um, me thinking out loud, maybe it turns into an exchange uh, sort of thing where now there's a, a marketplace for it, similar to you know Amazon's a public goods uh, marketplace. Uh, there are some services through like, like home services have gone to a centralized thing where if you need a plumber, you go into whatever the home website is and, you know, it's a marketplace for that. Uh, maybe those exist, maybe not. If you know of one, certainly share it with me uh, and I will look into it. Uh, advertising goes through different markets. If you remember Live Rail, um, people who want ads go there and then the ad providers go there and they make a marriage out of the two. So maybe a marketplace specifically to uh, NFTs. But I do think uh, that they are here to stay and certainly a way to make some money. So probably not the most advanced answer, but that's the best I can do for you. But great question. Okay. Uh, let's see what our next one is. European travel is supposed to open in early November airline stocks. Uh, okay. So here's my take on airline stocks. You can make airline, you can make money in airline stocks in short term. If you invest in an airline over any significant amount of time, uh, there's a significant chance it's going bankrupt. Uh, any industry that completely relies on the government to bail them out on 
uh, you know, on a regular basis, meaning if you can't fly for three days, is not a place that I'm going to attach any cash to. It's just not my kind of thing. Big, expensive uh, machines, um, highly qualified, highly trained, and high maintenance. Um, high maintenance being the personalities involved, uh, but high income, um, human capital that goes with it. You just, no, you can trade it, you know, reopening trades, you know, Europe, you know, they announce uh, new routes or anything. You can certainly make money in the short term, but they're, they're not long-term buy and hold stocks that, in my opinion, like an Apple, Amazon, or Google. Okay. Uh, what else you guys got? All right. Well, we'll bring this to a close. Again, thanks again for uh, coming out and attending this. I think this will grow over time. I think there will be far more questions over time, like what the heck is, you know, what's a firm? And, uh, you know, that was the one I referenced earlier. Uh, we can certainly talk into how to play different cryptos, um, that sort of thing. But <clears throat> we'll go ahead and conclude for the night. Uh, and we'll do this again. I will send out the um, you know, instead of it being a two day notice thing, this will be a regular scheduled event. We'll try to have all the board members where they can be there and, uh, you know, participate uh, more actively. Again, I sprung this on them this time. So again, and if you're interested in becoming a board member, reach out to me uh, separately and I will advise you on how that, how that can happen. So with that, thank you so much for listening in. Hopefully you found it informative and educational and appreciate your support as always. And we will see you next time. Bye.